It is a very exciting time to discover the possibilities and go beyond numerical targets to develop organizational cultures that allow both men and women to thrive together and really contribute to make Japan and Kansai an exciting and vibrant place to, to work and to live. Now we'd like to move into our keynote presentations. And we're truly delighted to have with us today, speaking on empowering women in the workplace, Director, Representative, Statutory, Executive Officer, Chairman, President, and CEO of MetLife Insurance, Mr. Sashin Shah. <laughs> Sashin, may I say just a few more words about you before you begin? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sashin has been with MetLife for 16 years and since 2006 was responsible for developing and executing MetLife's international business strategy. And since taking his current role in Japan in 2011, Sashin has generated tremendous momentum at MetLife toward creating the conditions that allow women and all employees to do their best work and utilize their full potential. His leadership in this area was recognized by the Cabinet Office of Japan earlier in the spring this year, when he was selected to be a member of a male Champions of Change group, which has been tasked with disrupting the status quo, love that troublemaker, <laughs> and shifting mindsets in their own organizations and role modeling for others. Not only has Sashin led the efforts inside MetLife, the company is a powerful supporter of external programs that are bringing awareness and education to this issue. So appreciating both his personal and organization's commitment, it is truly our great pleasure to welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Marianne. And I certainly hope that I don't let any of you down after that introduction. <laughs> Uh, I am absolutely delighted to be here at the first ACCJ Kansai Women in Business Summit. And importantly, to have this opportunity to talk to you about empowering women in the workplace, uh, a topic that I have a tremendous amount of personal interest in. In June, I took part in the ACCJ Tokyo Women in Business Summit as a panelist. And I just can't say that I, how honored I am to be a keynote speaker here today. So Kiran, Marianne, and everybody at ACCJ and Kansai, thank you so much. It's a true honor for me. We have over 500 employees in the Kansai area between Osaka and Kobe. And I visit Kansai on many, many occasions. And I find Kansai to be one of the most diversified regions of Japan, both historically and culturally. And many of the characteristics of Kansai people can be traced back to the region's merchant culture. And because of that culture, I know that the people here in Kansai pride themselves on doing business from the heart. And this in particular resonates with us at MetLife because caring for customers in their greatest time of need is at the heart of everything we do as a company. And at MetLife, our mission is helping people pursue more from life. We aim to make a difference not only in the lives of our customers, but also in the lives of our employees and in the communities in which we operate, like Kansai. We have approximately 100 million customers in 50 countries worldwide. To meet the diverse needs of these customers, we must have a diverse and inclusive employee base. It's not an option. It's not an initiative. It's the way we think about our business. And on this slide, you see that we also are quite proud of some of the awards we have won in the US for our corporate culture, particularly our progress in diversity and inclusion. 
We were ranked among the top 50 companies for executive women in 2014, as well as one of the best places to work in 2015. In Japan, we aim to become an employer of choice, and I will tell you, we have tremendous work to do with MetLife Japan to be able to put up a slide like this in five years about our Japan operation. For MetLife, diversity is not only about equal representation or being an employer of choice, it's simply about better decision making, creating competitive advantage, and ultimately outgrowing the market. It's kind of simple when you think about it. Over half our customers in Japan are women, exactly 51% to be precise. By the way, this not only applies to MetLife Japan, in the overall market, over half the people buying insurance in Japan are women. Not surprisingly, nearly 30% of the purchase decisions by men on life insurance are influenced by their wives. This means that more than 80% of the insurance purchase decisions in Japan are either made by or influenced by women. I don't know about you, but I certainly believe in the 80-20 principle. And as a man, I would like to believe that I understand women. I think my wife, my daughter, and all the women in the audience would disagree. And this is exactly why the business case for gender diversity in Japan is very clear, very compelling, and to me, a non-event. We need to move on. For the second half of my presentation, I'm going to share some quotations. I truly enjoy quotations. They make you think, they make you reflect, and most importantly, they ultimately allow you to personalize the meaning. And this one by Anne Frank is highly apt with regard to gender diversity in Japan. How wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. For me, this quote says it very simply that the time for action in Japan is now. A tremendous tailwind has been provided by Prime Minister Abe and the government, Japan, and the government of Japan's focus on this issue. And as Jay shared, Japanese lawmakers passed a law on Friday, August 28th, my birthday, requiring employers to set and publicize targets for hiring and promoting women as managers. This new law is a very important step towards creating greater transparency in hiring and increase in demand for women in leadership roles. Last month, MetLife hosted a symposium on gender diversity as part of the Japanese government's World Assembly of Women, Shine Weeks. We had a lot of thought-provoking discussion at this symposium. And the point that resonated strongest with me is, again, that the time for change is now. There is an ample supply of talented women available to hire. And so there really is no need to wait another single moment before we take steps as employers to empower women in the workplace in Japan. This next quote, I like a lot. And if you work at MetLife Japan, you get tired of seeing this. The difficulty lies not in accepting new ideas, but in, in escaping the old ones. And this quote, to me, goes to the heart of the mindset changes that are needed by men in Japan. We, men, need to forget about our old ideas, stereotypes about women. As Alan shared, I have a similar story as well. My mother was educated as a lawyer in India, and when we emigrated to the United States, 
She was not able to practice law. She took on many administrative jobs. She actually worked three jobs for many years while she went to school at night to become a computer programmer while raising myself and my younger brother. Through this, she became a computer programmer at a single employer and worked through that employer, rising to the executive ranks and retiring after 25 years with one company. And in fact, this one company was my first employer out of college. So for me, like for Alan, women having equal opportunity, working hard, raising a family, have always been part of my life and my ideals. And I think the point of the story and the quote is that change is never easy. At least in my experience, the best place to start is with our own individual mindsets and behaviors. And we all have unconscious biases. And so, to close on this quote, and what it really means for me, is take responsibility, men, for your own behavior and learning. Because awareness is the first step to bring about positive change. And bottom line is that men need to believe in women and give them equal opportunity and support. At the same time, women, you're not perfect. I know that's a surprise. <laughs> but you need to believe in yourself and have the confidence to overcome roadblocks in your path. And these next two quotes are for you, the women in the audience. If you can dream it, you can do it. And I like this one by Helen Keller actually the most. What I am looking for is not out there, it is in me. It's a great quote, and I think so apropos for what I see, at least in Japan, when it comes to helping women overcome their hesitations. So get out of your comfort zone, because it's really important. Believe in yourself, be confident, be open-minded, and take one step forward. Remember, there is no success without some failure. My final quote today is also one I use quite often with my team here in Japan. They're probably tired of seeing it as well. And it's a quote by Aristotle that I've used for many, many years. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act but a habit. And this ultimately to me gets to the role that we as employers and senior leaders of companies play in making this a habit. And so I'd like to share with you five things we're doing at MetLife Globally and at MetLife Japan that I hope if you're not already doing, you'll consider these as best practices that you can take forward. First, recruiting. We make sure that women, women candidates are identified for every management opening that we have. I will not approve the hiring of any manager in the company unless we have interviewed both women and men for the role. So we have to have women on the potential list. We want the most qualified candidate but we need to make sure that we're giving equal opportunity. We will not work with recruiters who cannot find female candidates for our positions. Second, talent reviews. We conduct regular talent reviews every month and then formally every quarter for not just men, but for our high potential women across all of our departments. Third, evaluation and development. We also ensure that we conduct an equal and fair performance review for all of our employees, but in particular female employees, 
And we push hard to make sure that when we do performance assessments for women, we are working past unconscious biases. And if you take the time to think about it, there's many unconscious biases that come into a performance review process. And that can often ultimately limit both the development of females, but also the equal opportunity that you're after. On the development front, we realize that women moving into management require different training than the training we provide to men who are moving into management. And we're now launching dedicated female leadership development program. Again, none of this is rocket science, but it's important to repeat these simple processes again and again, because ultimately excellence is a habit, as Aristotle said. As many of you know, I have my own very personal experiences around helping women to shine. My wife worked for more than 20 years in the pharmaceutical industry while we raised three children. And my daughter has just entered the working world. I have often found myself in several roles all at once, as a husband, a father, as a man, and as a senior executive. And I'd like to share some insights into how I have helped these two wonderful women to empower themselves professionally. First, something I've always said to both my wife and our daughter. First, take control. It's your career. It's up to you to decide what it is you want to achieve. And as I mentioned, my wife worked for more than 20 years. She's now retired, consulting, and an aspiring artist. She took control. And she's doing what she wants to do, and it's up to her to decide what it is that she wants. Second, aim high. There is no limit to what you can achieve in life. There are no women-only jobs. There are no men-only jobs. There are just jobs. And I certainly believe that my daughter is capable of becoming CEO of any company as she progresses through her career, if that's what she wants to do. And finally, and most importantly, just do it. Often the only thing standing in the way is yourself. There are not as many roadblocks and barriers as you may imagine. It's really your imagination that's more in the way than your capability. Take control, aim high, just do it. Things that have worked for me so far, with my wife and my daughter. So in closing, I'd like to congratulate again ACCJ Kansai for organizing this first Women in Business Summit. Event, events like this one today are vitally important to promoting dialogue and increasing the overall momentum for empowering women in the workplace in Japan. I'm truly honored to have been able to contribute on behalf of MetLife today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sashin, for sharing some really important points. I think the habits will be fantastic takeaways to create that habit of excellence and to identify our own unconscious bias as we move forward. I think that leads us well into our next keynote presentation. There's a lot of discussion about gender diversity and what are the facts, what unconscious bias are we carrying? And I think the evidence has something to tell us. As head of the OECD Tokyo Center, our next speaker is in a strong position to give us the facts. Utilizing OECD's immense treasure trove of data. But she has no shortage of personal experience to draw on as well, through her own 20-year career in international finance. She joined Goldman Sachs International in London after completing her MBA at Harvard eventually taking a manager-director role in New York and returning to Japan in 2008 as managing director of the Pan-Asia Equities Division. Taking on her current role at 
OECD in September 2013, she is a tireless promoter of gender diversity and equality, proactively sharing her experiences, both professional and personal, as a busy mother with young children. She's impacted many lives, and we're delighted that she's here today to share again on what evidence can tell us. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Yumiko Murakami. Thank you very much for having me here today. I'm very, very excited. This is actually the second time uh, for me uh, to be with ACCJ Osaka. Last year, I was invited um, as a speaker at one of the speaker series, and I had a very, very um, interesting session. Um, so I'm very, very happy to be back here today to share uh, some of the, hopefully you find interesting, data points uh, that OECD provides. Um, actually, Sutin is a father of my son's best friend. So that's how I know him. So it was very actually interesting to, 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 to really hear uh, his speech uh, because there was a lot of deep thought in it. You know, when I talk to him, I talk about, oh, play dates, sleep over, you know, for our sons. Um, so it was actually very, very uh, intriguing for me um, uh, to listen to his, uh, his presentation, which was very interesting. Uh, my presentation is, is going to be a lot about data points. Um, OECD, you probably hear um, about OECD through media, newspaper, you know, news, uh, when you look at the um, uh, Nikkei and so, so on and so forth, you see a lot of data points that are coming from OECD. So we are known to be, um, to be the institution, in international organization, which provides uh, international comparable data points, uh, which we collect, analyze, and we formulate policy recommendations to governments, business communities, academia in many different countries. So today I thought I would go through some of the interesting data points which hopefully will tell you exactly why we are talking about the importance of diversity. I'm a very, very optimistic person. I would like to start with a very, very, very good news. Look at this one. First of all, things to remember, Japanese women are better than any other women in any other countries when it comes to numeric and literacy skills. That's a pretty impressive chart. Look at that. Japan comes as the number one country. This is a comparison between Japanese women and other women in other countries that we, we actually um, uh, survey. So clearly, we have incredible talent pool here. Japanese women who are extremely well-educated, highly skilled, especially in the area of literacy and area of numeracy. So they can do math in their heads, no problem. They can read and write. No problem. This is pretty impressive. So this is a very good start. Good data point to remember. Now the second uh, good uh, data point is, this is actually coming from the Japanese government. The Japanese woman, when you look at the labor market participation, it's actually improving quite a bit. And thanks to Abenomics and thanks to the new policy that has been promoted by the government, look at this, it's a pretty nice Nice improvement, right? So if you look at the labor market participation by Japanese women, it's been steadily going up. And now at this point, it's over 30, uh, 73 percent or so, and that's a really decent uh, number. It's actually higher at this point than the OECD average. It's actually ba basically the same as the US. So in terms of market, uh, the labor market participation by Japanese women, it's actually no longer as bad as you might think. So that's a really good um, second point. Now, this is related to uh, the one that I showed you earlier. This is the well-known MCARB. Have you heard of this MCARB? Right? So what happens when women enter the labor market? They work for a couple of years, and a lot of them do get married, and, and when they have their first uh, 
child, a lot of them do drop out of the labor uh, market, and that's why you see the, the dip, that's the, uh, the, the end card. But if you look at this chart, you can see that dip is starting to disappear. The red line, you see 2013, you see the dip is actually as, as deep as before. So clearly, the Japanese government policy and also the business community uh, efforts really started to pay off. So like I said before, the labor market participation level going up and the, the, the M shape, M letter shape, uh, that's also starting to disappear. So really good data points. Now look at this one. This shows women with education. This is the, the, the woman with college uh, training, so people who have attended um, universities. If you look at the Japanese uh, number, you still see a pretty big gap between men and women. The way I would like to take a look at this data is there is a lot of potential, a lot of potential. Like I said, Japanese women are well-educated, extremely well-skilled, extremely smart when it comes to writing, reading, and, and mathematics. A lot of them have attended four-year college. But if you look at this data, you see a lot of upside. There are quite a few highly educated women who could be utilized in the labor market. Now, a lot of people say, well, yeah, Japanese women may be talented or skilled or educated, but you know what? They're not really interested in person Korea. Is that right? Actually, I've seen this Nikki survey where they ask uh, this question um, to women. I think it was uh, women in the late 20s and then maybe early 30s. The question was, would you like to have barikara or yurukara? Barikara is, is, a, is a, you know, basically aggressive career path. And yurukara is, you know, basically easy, you know, nine to five type of work. And the, the result is 70% of women say yurukara. So a lot of people, when I have meetings, when I have uh, dinner meetings with uh, k ran executives, a lot of them say to me, well, you know, yeah, I understand why it's important to promote women, but, you know, women themselves don't want this. And there are a lot of times, a lot of, the, you know, a lot of times they point to this, this type of survey, the Nikkei survey, and say, hey, women themselves don't want this, right? So I started to dig in a little bit and, and just to try to see if there are any data points to prove that they're wrong. I found them. So maybe you can use these data points when you have discussion on this topic with, um, with other people. Now, this show, this is a global survey. This shows how girls are more ambitious, uh, ambitious than boys. This is at the age of 15, we look at a number of different countries, including Japan, and we ask questions like, um, would you like to become uh, a manager or professionals when you grow up? And in almost all countries, actually pretty much all countries, except maybe for one, um, girls are more ambitious than boys. They say yes more than boys at the age of 15, including Japan. Japan, the gap is smaller than some of the other countries that you see here, but still, at the age of 15, girls are more ambitious than boys. But something may happen toward the end of their lives or midlife, so we'll talk about it later. Now, this is the Japanese stat. This is actually not coming from the OECD um, stats, but I wanted to show this to you. This is the Japanese um, uh, Kosei Rodosho, it's a Ministry of, of Labor, um, who actually does this survey on a regular basis. They ask questions like, um, uh, you know, would you, would you be interested in, in pursuing an aggressive career path? Okay, and if you look at this data, sorry, it's in Japanese. If you look at men and women, more women are more aggressive when it comes to career choices. In their 20s, especially in the, in the, in the teens and the 20s, starting to change in the 30s. But you see the difference between men and women? In, this is Japan only. See, to my point earlier, women are actually a lot more ambitious than men, even in the 20s, up until probably the early 30s. That's when they start having problems in terms of balancing um, family and then work. And then this, the other question they ask is, would you like to work overseas? Again, this is, a, this is coming from the same data that comes from the government. And more women say yes than men. More, more women want to work overseas. They want to have career opportunities outside Japan. 
when they're in the 20s, uh, when they're teenagers, when they're 20s, and, and again, things start to, to start to change when they're 30s, when they, that's when they start having families. So again, to my point, um, I'm not sure if the Nikkei survey really paints the picture correctly. In my opinion, when women have a lot of responsibilities at home, um, I don't have a chart here. We have a survey, another survey, which shows Japanese women sleep less than any other woman in the, in the world. Okay, this is including women who have you know, jobs or including women who actually stay at home. They sleep less than any other woman in the world. So you're asking the question, would you like to have body kata, yuru kata? It's like asking a question of, would you like to live like a human being? Right? Because you're sleeping already less than any, any, any other woman in the world, and you are actually comparing um, you know, yourself to maybe your husband or your, your fathers or your male colleagues who are putting literally 18 hours a day at work. Again, by the way, we don't have a chart here, but the, uh, the, the survey that we do uh, at OECD shows Japanese men work longer than any other men in the world. So just combining these two data points, men working longer than any one in the world, in Japan. Women sleeping less than anyone in the world. So you ask the question to Japanese women, would you like to have barikera yurukera? You know the answer. You want to live like a decent human being. Anyway, so let's look at this interesting stat. It's a little bit of a different angle. Um, you probably realize that not many women choose to study science and technology uh, in Japan, and that's, by the way, is a case in, in almost all countries. And if you look at the uh, top performers, uh, you know the, the the survey that I showed you earlier in terms of 15-year-old uh, uh, children in terms of their you know uh, ambitious uh, goals for life, um, a lot of actually high-performing boys they decide to choose science and technology as their majors, and not a lot of girls do. So we look at top performers of mathematics, and you will see clear difference between boys and girls. This is again at the age of 15, in almost all countries, including Japan. And partially because a lot of boys are encouraged and they are actually likely to go and study science and technology than girls. But the, the fact is there is a gap when it comes to the top performer, uh, top performer uh, um, mathematics results. But what's interesting is, when you do the same test among the, with the same people, same children, you tell the girls who are taking the same test that this test is going to be easy for them. You tell them, look, this is something you can do easily. This is something that you should be able to do easily. Guess what happens? The gender gap disappears by 50%. No difference in terms of the knowledge level, no training, no tutoring, nothing at all. It's the confidence level. When you know that you have ability to do it, when you know you're confident in your own ability or skills, the result is better. This is really telling. This is extremely important because I think this is a very important lesson I think all of us really should remember. It's not sometimes so much about the knowledge, it's a lot of times it's a confidence level that makes a difference. And this is proven by the stats. Again, this is actually proven in almost all countries, including Japan. The 50% gap uh, which disappears is average, but depending on the country, uh, the gap can disappear a lot at, at a much higher level. Okay, so for those of you who came to my seminar last year, saw this picture, and I want to share this with you again because I think this is a really interesting story. This is the New York Philharmonic uh, today, and it's not a very good picture, but can you tell um, that the people who are playing, the musicians and the conductor? Okay, now I want you to compare this picture to this one, which is the same orchestra 30 years ago. Now, what's the difference? Well, there are many differences, but look at this one and this one. When I was here, when I was in Osaka last year to give this talk, um, I was relieved that no one said, oh, it's color and black and white. <laughs> yeah, it is one of the differences, but 
Okay, there are more important differences that I would, I would, I would like to point out. Uh, first of all, you see today there are a lot of women compared to 30 years ago, right? Not only that, there are quite a few non-Caucasian musicians, a lot of Asian, um, actually, um, musicians. My brother-in-law, by the way, who's Japanese, is a New York Philharmonic Orchestra member. And he tells me that, depending on the section, like for example, first violin, 50% woman, Asian, which was never the case before. Now, even uh, if you can look at the conductor very closely, up until Alan Gilbert, who is the current conductor of New York Philharmonic, um, every single New York Philharmonic conductor was Caucasian male. Alan is actually half Japanese, half Caucasian, I can't remember where his father was from. Anyway, he speaks Japanese. He looks Japanese, actually, as well. Uh, the first time that they had someone like Alan, who's multinational, multi-ethnic background, to have as a conductor for the New York Philharmonic. So what happened about 25, no, about 30 years ago, was they introduced the blind auditioning method. Do you know what that is? It's basically the audition where put, they put this screen between the, um, between the musician who comes in for the audition and the people who are sitting in the back trying to decide which one is the best. Up until then, before they introduced the blind auditioning, pretty much everyone who, all the musicians who were selected or passed the test were male and Caucasian. As soon as they introduced the blind auditioning, they started to have all these women and Asian, non-Caucasian, just different type of people. Do you know why? It's very powerful to see something. In your head, you're trying to tell yourself, a lot of times I do myself, that you, should you should not be biased, you know? I, there, there, there's always good person inside of you who is telling you, you should, not, you should not be biased. If someone looks a certain way, doesn't mean that person is whatever. But seeing is extremely powerful. The visual effect is very powerful. So even if you're not really thinking that way, it just sends certain signals to your brain. So a white person, white male person, comes on the stage, starts playing the violin, you're, li you're listening to the violin, you are looking at this person, it just feels like the, the, you know, the sound is powerful. Next person comes in who happens to be Asian woman, and you're looking at her playing the violin, and you're listening, you're listening, but you're looking at her as well. And because of the visual effect, it sounds less powerful, because she's small, maybe. So she's gone. When you have blind auditioning, you get rid of that bias. And the lesson is extremely important. This is what happens every day in a workplace. Unconscious bias, as Tim was saying. Everyone has it. I have it. You have it. I think the important thing is you know you have it, and you remind yourself that you have it. And guess what happened to the New York Philharmonic after they introduced the um, uh, blind auditioning? Their repetition just started to become very, very strong versus the European orchestras who were not introducing this blind auditioning. They were still very much traditional in terms of the way they select their uh, members. And now, as you probably know, the New York Philharmonic is one of the best uh, orchestras in the world. No-brainer, because they have a wider pool of talents they can attract and they have unbiased selection process. So they get, they get to pick the best without being biased by certain ideas that you may have in your head. It applies to the business community in Japan. So that's why I wanted to show this, uh, this slide. Okay. Um, so for those of you who are uh, thinking, oh, I'm going for Yudukara, you understand why. You may think Yurikara may be a better way of, uh, of, uh, of uh, sort of navigating a career. Um, 
it's not uh, so much about your, uh, you know, your ability. It's about the confidence. And for those who are in a management position, it's really important that you try to remind yourself, you can never get rid of this bias. It's always going to be there, but I think it's important that you know that you have it, so you remind yourself and you try to remind everyone else when it comes to selecting people, recruiting, when it comes to uh, mentoring people, when it comes to promoting people. Now, the reason why I thought I would introduce uh, these stories, again, this is just a, a number of female um, orchestra members in the US uh, orchestras, which introduced the uh, um, blind auditioning, is that, um, as you heard, the bill has been introduced to disclose gender information on companies, uh, companies who have more than 300 people, 300 employees or more. So it's important because you, um, you don't know where to start if you don't disclose information. You can't move the needle if you don't know where the needle is. So with this new bill, you know where the needle is so you can move forward. That's great. And I have, you know, I'm very excited about the new bill. And like I said before, the number is actually very, very encouraging in terms of labor market participation. M-shape is disappearing. But I think what we are facing here is just not numbers. The economy that we are in is really very much driven by knowledge economy. In the knowledge economy society, what's most important is human. A lot of jobs are disappearing because of technology. You know, quite frankly, a lot of jobs which are done by human people will disappear in the next five to 10 years. It's already disappearing. So what we need to do is to make sure that people who work can add value, which is impossible to be uh, replaced by computer, internet, um, robots. And those companies who can do this are the ones who are going to see much, much better innovative environment. And that's how, you produce, that, how, that's how you improve the productivity. We have a lot of stats that shows that the companies who have diverse labor force have much better chances of succeeding because of innovation. When you have one kind of people, it's very limited in terms of different ideas. I was with a professor from Harvard Business School last week, and she has done a lot of interesting studies. And one of the things that she said, which I, I thought I would just share this with you today, is that when this very, very um, respected company in the United States, technology company, when the scientists and, and, and computer scientists and programmers, when they get stuck with the ideas, what they do is they bring these science scientists and, and programmers to this uh, place. Uh, it's sort of like an off-site place. And they bring in a bunch of uh, young college female students who have very little experience with technology. And they have brainstorming sessions. Why? Because these college students, by the way, these scientists and technology people, most of them are men. And these young college uh, students who are mostly women, they have very little experience with technology. They discuss things. They may ask very, very naive questions, very simple questions, very basic questions. But they bring in interesting perspectives, things that they never, the scientists never thought of before. And that's what they do on a regular basis to move forward when they get stuck. And actually, it's a very good, uh, it's one of the best practices that a lot of Silicon Valley companies are doing now because they realize having different perspectives, whether they have a specialist background or not, or whether they are coming from certain schools or not, whether they're coming from certain country, religion, it doesn't matter. What you want to have is as many different uh, background people as possible who can bring different perspectives so that they can break through you know, especially when they're stuck. And that's exactly what the Japanese economy needs. And that's why I say this is a womanomics 2.0. I think we're almost there in terms of 1.0, in terms of having more female employees, more female workers in the workplace. We need to get to 2.0, where women are maximized in terms of their contributions because they have different perspectives. And they have something different to bring to the table versus men. And that's it for the day, and thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you.